of warning. Many of you I know, and every once in a while I'm able to share in your worship experience. Um, Dave is in the, off in the audience. My husband has the distinct privilege of being a pastor full-time in Ottawa, Illinois, and sometimes I don't get all the way to Ottawa, and so I come and worship with you, and I'm grateful for those times. Let us bow. Holy God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this worship experience where we have heard and sung and shared. We pray that you will be present now and that you will bless the, the words that are spoken and the thoughts and the meditations of our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Any of you who have more than one child know what it is to have sibling rivalry, or perhaps you are a si sibling and have been in a rivalrous situation. Well, in 2006, my daughters were both expecting babies in April. Margaret lived in Wisconsin, and she went to doctors in the hospital up in Dubuque, Iowa, Elisa was married uh, to an Air Force person, and they were stationed down in Louisiana. Both daughters were asking for my help at the time of their children's birth. Well, I didn't realize how much rivalry had gone on between them, but I knew that there was many times when the two of them were competing with each other. I think the worst was when we moved to Thompson, and we had them both in the same bedroom. And finally, Margaret took a piece of masking tape and put it down the middle of the room and said, this part is mine and this part is yours. Eventually, we decided maybe they needed to be in two separate bedrooms, and so they were. Well, as it happened, Margaret went to Thompson High School and it was fortunate that by the time Elisa was in high school, I had been appointed to Hanover United Methodist Church, and that way they didn't have to compete on the, quite the same level because they went to two separate high schools. Then the two of them uh, went on to college and eventually were married. In fact, Margaret had her first child in 2004, at the time, just a couple months after Elisa got married. But then, unbeknownst to me, the, t the contest began. Which one would have the next grandchild? I didn't know anything about it, but Margaret called me one day and said, Mom, Roger and I are going to have another baby. And I was ecstatic. But at the same time, Elisa called and said, Mom, Margaret, and Roger are having a baby. <laughs> well, it wasn't long before I realized that there was some kind of a contest going on that I wasn't aware of. And a couple weeks later, Elisa called and she was all smiles and happy and said, Guess what? James and I are also expecting a baby. I never thought much more about it, and I looked at the calendar and said, okay, April, let's see, that's Easter and all those activities. And being a full-time pastor, I knew it was going to be hard for me to get away from my job. But I only had two daughters, they only had one mom, and I knew that the church could get another pastor, and so the choice wasn't much of a choice. It was, I was going to be a mom or a grand, grandmother. Jesus had a family. We know the names of some of the members. In fact, uh, Mary holds quite a prominent place in Jesus' life. We know from the very beginning that Jesus' was uh, Jesus mother Mary was chosen, and she had a lot to do with his life. And one of the things that she did was she called on Jesus to catch the people who ran out of wine at the, 
wedding ceremony. And so in the Gospel of John, we hear about that situation. We also know that Jesus' mother, Mary, was at the crucifixion. I can't imagine what she must have been going through as she watched her son being crucified. But Jesus was close to his mother, and he loved her very much. And it, it's also recorded in the Gospel of John about how hanging on the cross, he saw his mother and he said to her, woman, here is your son. And he pointed to, or he uh, made the reference to one of the disciples who was there. And it was touching to see that Jesus, even at this point where he's being crucified, thought to take the responsibility and make the arrangements for his mother to care for her. In the passage for today, we have the story of Jesus with two other women, another Mary and Martha. Jesus liked being with Mary and Martha. I have a feeling that Martha was probably a pretty good cook. And it was during the situation that this dilemma comes up. Martha had been busy doing all the things you need to do in order to pre prepare for a special guest. I can imagine what she had gone through. She had dusted and swept. She had been to the market and bought all the things that she needed. She had been cutting and cooking, and she was determined that she was going to make a blue ribbon meal for her friend Jesus. While she was busy doing all these things, what was her sister doing? She was sitting at Jesus' feet, just listening, hanging on to Jesus' every word. Well, finally, having watched Mary just sit there for some time, she turned to Jesus and said, Don't you care about the fact that I'm here slaving away, sweating my brow, while... She's just sitting there, not helping at all. Well, Jesus, with a diff disappointed sigh, says, Martha, you have a different priority. Mary has chosen the better choice. Mary was commended for her making the better choice. What priorities do you have in your life? There's all kinds of things that compete for our time and our attention. And we have to make choices about exactly which are going to have priorities. We know that there's certain things that every person has to do. We have to eat, and we have to get a certain amount of sleep, and we have to dress. We have to have a place to live, and we have to have some source of income in order to pay for that place to live. But sometimes what we earn is more than enough to pay for our basic necessities. Then we need to make decisions about how are we going to use that, what they call discretionary funds. The same is true of our time. Let's see, all of us have how many hours in a day? 24. Anybody who has more than that? Mm, I didn't think so. And we have to decide how are we going to spend that 24 hours. Well, we know that our bodies require enough sleep. I remember those days of having babies and not being able to get enough sleep. Our son and daughter-in-law that live down in the Quad Cities have recently um, added to their family. And they have a one-year-old and a newborn. And my son is saying how difficult it is to get enough sleep with the two of them. Well, there was a study done, and it found out that on the average, Americans are getting one to two hours less than they used to be getting 30 or 40 years ago. And I thought, that sounds strange, but maybe it's true. But in order to be healthy, we know that we need to have a certain amount of sleep. And some of us can do with a little less than others. And you'll have to decide for yourself exactly how much sleep you need to get in order to stay healthy. 
But what about the rest of your time? How much it, of it is spent I in frivolous activities? You know, that box that you watch TV. I had made up my mind this last fall that I was not going to watch any of the new programs and get hooked on them. Well, it didn't take long before I got hooked on one or two of them. And then there's that, that other box that has now become a laptop or something smaller than that. You know, the thing that you get emails and you can get onto the Internet. And I realize that all of us have choices to make about how much time we're going to spend watching TV or checking our emails. I noticed that your July Telstar brought it up here. Oh, there's this little note. It says, take time to pray. I have a feeling that if I asked Joe, he probably would have said, oh, that was just a filler. Maybe not. Well, we all know it's important to pray, but you have, have you ever kept thought about how much time you pray? I'm getting ready to attend a five-day retreat in spiritual formation, and one of the suggested books is called Sacred Chaos by Tricia McCary Rhodes. And although I had not heard of her or the book before, it was a recommended book for this retreat, and so I decided, well, maybe I better start reading it since I'm going to that a week from tomorrow. And within 20 page, 20 pages, she had me hooked. And the dedication, she writes, to my grandchildren, Marnie and Abe, whose presence has helped me discover the sacred within the chaos of the life I have. Well, I thought, okay, what is this about Marnie and Abe? Well, she went on to tell the story that she was assigned to write a book about spiritual disciplines, and she decided that she would be very intentional about saying if she was going to write a book about it, that maybe she better experience it. So she decided that she would start being very intentional about keeping track of exactly how much time she prayed and how much time she spent reading scripture and all the little things that go into spiritual formation. <coughs> Excuse me. She was determined in order to write about the possibilities of personal retreats and of taking long walks along a, a deserted beach or withdrawing from the chaos of life for seasons of silence and solitude. Well, just at the point that she was really concentrating on these things, her son, his wife, and two grandchildren moved in with them. So now in addition to the ordinary minutia, things like paying bills and answering emails and fixing broken dryers and trimming bushes, going to the grocery store, returning phone calls, she had to return to trying to figure out how was she going to get quiet time for herself. She wrote of one particular chaotic morning. She stumbled out of bed figuring that she would be up before the children and before her husband and her, the rest of the family. And she went into the kitchen to make a cup of coffee. And as she's making the coffee, there's those little brown things on the floor. And she realized it was not spilled coffee grounds. It was ants. Well, her first thought was that she was going to go crawl back in bed and put the covers over her. But her husband had already taken that spot and decided that he was going to have his quiet time in the bedroom. So instead, she returned to the kitchen and started getting rid of the ants by spraying some kind of poison. And then she decided, well, she needed to wipe it up because she didn't want the grandchildren to be poisoned as well. So 45 minutes later, she takes her now sort of tepid cup of coffee 
and goes to sit at the kitchen table in order to start her quiet time. Now she's prepared to go into the living room, sit there quietly, and listen for God. And as she collapses on the couch, guess what happened? The baby started to cry. Well, she decided she would just plug up her ears so she wouldn't hear. But by that time, he had awakened his three-year-old sister, and she came bounding into the living room and jumped into the author's lap and said, Grandma, I need some girl love right now. Now, who could pass that up? Well, it's been an inspiration to read that sometimes things unexpected happen in our lives, even when we're determined that we're going to spend time with God. Do you know how that is, Pastor? <laughs> she made the choice to let her priority be her family for the next eight months. Her struggle to forge a path through the chaos of life with authenticity in order to share the joy of hearing God through the noise and stress and monotony of every day was intensified for those eight months. She was reminded of a principle used by physical therapists called the two-minute miracle. Now, working in the hospital, I've seen physical therapists. They come into a patient, and they know the patient needs to get up and needs to walk around a little bit because, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so they come in, and, of course, the patients immediately go, oh, you. And they don't even want to get out of bed. Sometimes it hasn't even been 24 hours since they've had some kind of surgery, and they have no intention of getting up and trying to do some kind of physical activity, much less walk down the hall. Well, they found that they had this two-minute principle, and you encourage the people to get out of bed and walk around for just two minutes. And pretty soon, the, the patient is able to get out of bed and sees the advantage of two minutes, and they're willing to go three minutes, four minutes, maybe even five minutes. And as they increase that time, they realize, and the patient begins to realize the advantage. So um, Tricia Rhodes decided, maybe we could use this principle in our quiet time in our prayer life. So we start with two minutes. And on the first day, you choose two minutes. Now in two minutes, you're not even going to be able to go through all the requests for prayer requests that are in the newsletter or the bulletin. The list gets pretty long. But instead of concentrating on those lists of names and all those needs, she says you concentrate on trying to listen for God. Now, I noticed our quiet prayer time was exactly 15 seconds long. Do you suppose we could increase that to 30 seconds? It's hard to be quiet, isn't it? I remember doing a sermon similar to this at one of my previous appointments, and I was determined to make that quiet time 60 seconds long. You know how long 60 seconds is when you are just trying to concentrate on listening for God? There were quite a few people who came up to me after the service and said, that silence was too long. Sometimes the chaos of life just interferes. Do you suppose we could start with less than two minutes and eventually figure out that God wants to talk to us? We think of all those things we want to tell God. We want to praise God for the day. What beautiful weather we have today or complain about the weather. We talk to God about all our friends and our relatives who need prayers and healing. And we think about all the people that are listed in the bulletin and in the newsletter, and we, we want to bring them all up. And all God wants to do is just have us listen. 
much as Mary sat and listened for Jesus, God wants us to sit and listen. What could we do in order to spend that quiet time with God? What if instead of wallowing in guilt that we're not doing it long enough or getting all worried about the list of all those people and all those needs that we're aware of, what if we tried just for this next week that two-minute policy of getting up? Okay, some of you may say, well, I don't have a problem. I'm retired. I talked to Vivian, and she said, now that I'm retired, I have less time, right? <laughs> and I thought that after I had taken in, or come back from being full-time pastor that, you know, I only work two days a week at the hospital, and my family has grown, and, um, what, four or five days a week, I actually live by myself out at the condo. Why would I have any trouble trying to squeeze out two minutes? Believe it or not, there are days when I realize, and I thought, okay, I'm supposed to be the, the leader, help facilitate this five-day spiritual formation, and I can't even squeeze out two minutes. And I realize it's going to become even harder this next week. Our daughter, Elisa, and her two children are driving this way from Mountain Home, Idaho, and are going to be spending the next couple weeks with us. Then it's going to be very much like that story that Tricia told about trying to get two minutes of quiet. But let's try it. Recognize God as the one who influences our every thought, word, and deed. Move on and thank God in one sentence or two, and then realize that God can help us even in the chaos of our life. I thought that I'm going to especially need that this next couple weeks. Chaos, is that the way you would show your or explain your life? Instead of being worried and upset about many things like Martha was, be willing to sit at Jesus' feet, so to speak, and life will become more of a joy because you realize that you have chosen the more important thing. Let us pray. Holy God, we know that amidst all the mundane things that we have to do, whether we're older or younger, whether we have children running around or whether our children are grown and we have an empty nest, whether we have other responsibilities and groups that we belong to, pressures, we know that you are to be a priority in our life. Help us this week to set aside two minutes of joyful reflection, just listening for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.